Well, we are here at Capclave for a special fast forward with John Scalzi Hello. and a live studio audience or a live function room audience. <laughs> <laughs> So, John, welcome to Fast Forward. Thank you. It's good to be here. Now, one thing I want to talk to you about to begin with is, like a lot of writers that I like, you kind of started in writing in, with a news, working in a newspaper. Yeah, that's right. Uh, as a critic, as not a journalist journalist, but as a critic working. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> well, not breaking the big stories right, and stop right. the presses. Right. But um, what was that like, and how did it help lead you into to working on novels? Well, it was great. I, my first job right out of college was as a movie critic, so immediately everybody I went to college to wanted to stab me because we graduated in 1991. There was a recession going on, and they were like, I don't know what I'm going to do with myself. I, you know, I'll have to be working at the at the 7-Eleven. What are you doing? Oh, I'm going to be a film critic. And they're like, I have a bus I want to push you in front of. Could you actually just stand here and do that? Um, but So for me, it was actually a great experience for a number of reasons. One of the things that I learned to do was I learned to write very quickly because uh, a movie critic job is, sounds like a lot of fun, but it is actually work because you have to go see a movie every day. I know real hard, but then you have to go and you have to write anywhere from 300 to 800 words about it, and you have to write it on deadline, and sometimes you basically have 20 minutes to do a review. Like I would go see a movie on Wednesday night, and Wednesday uh, midnight was our deadline for the Friday paper, right? It's not, back, it's not like it is now where you can just press a button and it goes up onto the, onto the internet. Um, so I would come back. The movie would start at 7. I would come back about 10. I would have to have it done by 11 so that it could be copy edited to make the, you know, the final at midnight. And so you learn to write quickly. You learn to express yourself clearly. And you learn to get it right the very first time. Now, this came in incredibly helpful when it was time for me to write books because I could sit down and write a very large amount of words just by muscle memory uh, and write very clean copy, which I know that my editor appreciated quite a lot because, you know, sometimes uh, things get sloppy when you're writing books. So that was actually incredibly useful, just the mechanical process of writing every single day and writing for an audience and, and having to explain yourself in a very clear manner so that they understood what was going on. Uh, the second thing that was very helpful was the beat I was working on was Hollywood, you know, and so I learned about uh, what it was like to, you know, make movies, learned, I, I interviewed hundreds of filmmakers, actors, directors, producers, um, so I had this base of knowledge that so when it came time for me to write a novel, when I sat down and said, now I got to find out if I can actually do this or not, uh, I could write from what I knew, which was, um, this broad expanse of knowledge about uh, movies and about the movie industry. And so the very first novel I wrote, my practice novel, uh, was Agent to the Stars. And the idea behind that is aliens come, they get Hollywood representation. And the fact that I knew as much as I knew about Hollywood uh, made it very easy to write because I had that knowledge base. This is one of the reasons why I suggest to people, you know, uh, young people often ask me, well, should I go in and get a writing degree or you know, creative writing, I say, no, you should actually go get a degree that allows you to do something else so that you can have a larger uh, store of knowledge so that when it comes time to write, because a writer is going to write no matter what, uh, then you are able to pull in some knowledge uh, aside from the writing. Right. Plus, I would think that writing criticism of all the movies you see and all that would you'd be looking at them critically and, and with an eye towards what's the story. So I would think you'd learn something about storytelling and story structure just from thinking about movies. That's absolutely correct. Uh, I watched for story every day for five straight years. Every day I would go, well, how do you tell the story? What's working? What's not? And so you learn how to, how to see how a good storyteller tells a story. It doesn't mean that there is a particular one way to tell a story, but you ask, what did the what did what did the storyteller here set out to do? Have they achieved their objective? Uh, if so, how so? If not, how so? Um, and that was actually incredibly important. Uh, it also gave me a template. Um, when I first uh, sent uh, Old Man's War and Agent to the Stars to my agent, or the, the person I was hoping would be my agent, Ethan Ellenberg, uh, one of the first things that he came back to me with was. Did you write these as screenplays first? Because they had a very traditional sort of 
three-act structure. And it's like, well, that's the stories, you know, those were the stories that I've been watching for the last five years, so it's naturally going to come through with that. But it is absolutely true that if you spend, it's just like a good writer reads. You read constantly, um, and there's a lot of people I know are paranoid that something that they'll read will get into their work. It's like, well, yes, that's what you're <laughs> aiming for, the whole idea of learning how storytelling works. I read, but I also watched, and I was watching with a critical eye. Although, ironically, the most helpful thing for me as a writer was not reading uh, or watching uh, movies, but after I was done being a, a movie critic, I went off to America Online, uh, which was the Google of its day, as we like to say. <laughs> Mid-90s, everybody thought AOL was going to take over the world. Um, and I had a job there as an editor. And I was an editor for a humor area. And I got to tell you, that was the most useful thing that I've ever done, uh, strictly from the writing point of view. Before that, I was in my early to mid-20s. And I thought I was a brilliant writer. You know, how could I not think I was a brilliant writer? I was a guy who was a, a, you know, the youngest syndicated film critic in the United States. I had a syndicated newspaper column where I wrote about whatever I wanted when I was 24. I was amazing, right? And then I went and I had to edit this humor area where I had 20 empty spaces a month. I had 10, uh, 1,000 submissions a month for those 20 spaces. And at the end of getting through all those submissions, at the end of every month, I still had 10 spaces left to fill because it's really hard to do humor. And so I would have to talk to the people whose work was almost there but not quite and break it down to them going, this is what you know, we need from you. This is why this isn't working. Can you uh, fix this? Here's an example of what I mean. Now can you do something similar to that? Basically having to spend a lot of time. So not only looking at structure and story, but also just looking at the mechanics of writing, which I never had to do before. Um, and the result of that is when I was done doing that, I went back to my, the pieces that I wrote before, the columns that I wrote, and I looked at them with a critical eye for the first time, and it, it went from me thinking, oh, this is all brilliant, to me going, <gasps> this is horrible. I wrote 80 columns, and of those 80 columns, three of them I would, as an editor, have accepted for publication, and two of them needed s a, quite a lot of work. Um, and that taught me one thing. One, you know, editors are actually useful and needed. Uh, which is something that writers don't always you know, uh, learn. Uh, and second of all, um, that it helped me be critical about my own work so that you know, the tools that I had before, writing quickly, you know, writing in a clever fashion, writing in a manner uh, that was clear, were f basically put into the crucible and, and burned away uh, all the cruft so that I actually could just get to the point and be merciless with my own writing because if I was... If I wasn't going to do it, somebody else was. Um, and why put them through that? You know, you know, try to get it right as much as, right as you can the first time, then send it off to the editor so they have less work. Um, and it's closer, the final, final product is closer to what you intended. Right. Then in, was it 98, you became a full-time freelance writer? Yes. But you didn't publish your first even nonfiction book until for like a couple of years? Until 2000. All these things take time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what on earth made you decide I'm going to go, go full time freelance, mm -hmm. when you didn't know if you if you could actually make a living at it? I got fired. Oh, okay. Well, I'll do it. <laughs> oh, that's right. You were working for AOL. I was working for AOL. <laughs> um, and what happened? I, I I was a I was a layoff of one, and it wasn't fired like you know I did something wrong. I was kicked out. I worked for a group that basically was a uh, company-wide resource, right? People had problems, they came to us, we would solve them. We were the firemen of, of AOL, so to speak. That group dissolved. Um, all the other people in the group had specific skills, program director skills or programming skills or something like that. Um, but I was the writer. And the problem with being the writer and being an in, uh, a company-wide resource is Nobody wants to put in their department a person who is used by the entire company. It's supposed to be each department has its own budget. So basically nobody wanted to put me on the budget. Um, and so I was a layoff of one. Um, and it was incredibly depressing because up until that point, again, remember this is me, uh, early, mid-20s, and everything was going my way. Everything was fantastic. And then through completely incomprehensible reasons, I was just like, funk, I'm sorry, off you go. And it really threw me into a tailspin. And I was like, 
what the heck, you know, what the heck? And then I had to really make a decision. My wife and I both sat down and was like, are we going to let this define this or are we going to kind of move forward? And we decided that we were going to move forward. I would become a freelance writer and, you know, basically see what happens. Now, the good news is we made that decision and then literally the next day people started calling us up and, you know, from AOL. They're like, we just realized that we don't have anybody to do any writing. Will you come back as a consultant? We'll pay you twice as much. You only work half as much. And I'm like, I'm down with this. Um, I, I had seen that happen to a lot of people. It's, they it's, laid off and they're back like a month later making more money. Right, exactly. Now, you know, my, it was, and it was great for us because the folks that my wife were working, was working for, she was working part-time at that time, and they were so concerned about her leaving um, that they basically said, don't go, we'll put you full-time and give you benefits. You know, and it's like, wow. So basically, uh, we decided that you know, we're going to make this work one way or the other, and then the universe said, well, well done for you that you decided to do this now, bing, 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 bing. So it worked out very well for us. So I got pushed into it, but I often tell people, and I, and I mean this with all sincerity, that being laid off from America Online was the, one of the best things that ever happened to me because it made me realize that I had to be in control of my own career um, or otherwise you know, I was going to be at the mercy of, of other people. And for a writer specifically, that is a great lesson to learn because you really are so much of the time as a writer contingent upon whether other people will accept your work or whether other people like what you're doing. Uh, so much of your career is not in your control that it really behooves you as a writer to take as much control as you can so that uh, when someone doesn't like something or when something doesn't work out, you still have other options. You still have the ability to continue on with your life. Right, right. And then Old Man's War hits. <laughs> and that changed your life again, didn't it? It was very weird. <laughs> um, it was, I don't think anybody was expecting it to do as well as it did. Uh, the first printing of Old Man's War uh, was 3,700 books, which is not a whole lot of books. Um, and what had actually happened to that is it sold so quickly that uh, we basically sold out of the first printing in a, in a couple of weeks. And for about a month, I think three weeks, four weeks, you literally couldn't find it. I mean, it just was impossible to find. And, and I, I remember... Uh, Tor was like, what just happened? And what had happened was Cory Doctorow and uh, uh, Glenn Reynolds of Instapundit both said to their uh, respective and completely different uh, crowds, go get this book. And uh, on the internet, um, it's, not, uh, it's not like if you see something on a TV show, uh, no offense, and, uh, <laughs> and, and someone says, oh, and this is Old Man's War, go get it at your local bookstore. On the internet, it feels much more intimate. So when Glenn Reynolds, in particular, said to his uh, uh, readers, this is a really good book. You should go get it. Um, it was as if I, me, John Scalzi, was saying to you, go get this book right yeah. now. You, will, you won't be disappointed. There, there is something strange about reading something on the internet, as you said, like said, opposed to TV, that it feels like this person is writing this to me. Yeah, it's, much more, it's a much more immediate yeah. thing. Uh, and so what happened was the, the, everybody who read Glenn and a lot of the people who read Corey was like, okay, I'll go get it. And they went and got it and uh, everyone was surprised. And then, you know, the reviews were good. Uh, and then afterwards, um, the, the nominations, the Hugo nominations came out um, and I was up for the Camel and the Hugo, which was the first time that it, it happened in like 22 years. So all of a sudden people were like, who the, you know, who the heck is this John Scalzi guy? Um, the irony the about is that this is, John who is this John Scalzi guy, and why does he smell so bad? Um, the yeah. irony of this is, is that... You smell like a spring day guy. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, I do feel kind of lilac fresh. The irony of this is, is that I, the reason that I was on the ballot in 2006 for the Hugo ballot um, was actually because of a, uh, the sort of generosity of another writer, specifically Neil Gaiman. Neil Gaiman had won three Hugos in three years, one a year and as opposed to three each year. Um, and when he was nominated for Anansi Boys uh, for novel, at that point he was like, you know, I've just won all these Hugos. Um, it's time to, you know, perhaps let somebody else, you know, have a shot at this. And so he declined that nomination. And so the number six book then became the number five book, and that number six book was me. And he was absolutely right. He was absolutely right, and it made the world of difference for me. So when the first time I met uh, Neil Gaiman, uh, 
what I said to him is, I owe you a fruit basket, because it really made a, a huge difference. Yep. Now, let's change gears a little bit. We talked about your writing. Let's talk about your political career, <laughs> being, being president of CIFWA. Right. Um, why don't you tell people a little bit about that most of the people here in our audience probably know, but they may not, mm. but people out in the television sure. audience may not, of what CIFWA is and what it does and what it, what you, why you wanted to become president of CIFWA. Sure. Well, CIFWA is an acronym. It's for Science Fiction Fantasy Writers of America. And it's basically the organization of science fiction and fantasy writers. And what we do is we advocate for them. We make sure uh, as much as we can that uh, they are uh, being treated fairly by publishers. We make a lot of noise when they're not. We act as a resource for them to find work, to discuss uh, ab about the changing markets. Um, when there are times that uh, our members are uh, find themselves at loose ends in a medical uh, way, for example, you know, uh, emergencies, uh, we have an emergency medical fund and an emergency legal fund to help uh, ease their problems with that. And uh, we also are just we're a clubhouse. And uh, I, when I joined, I joined uh, basically the day I got my contracts back from tour, saying yes, we bought Old Man's War. I faxed them off to Sifu because I wanted to be in the same in the same club that Robert Heinlein had been in. Uh, and for many years, that was enough for me um, because I was in the fortunate position of not having to need a lot of the resources that, that Sifu had. But the more that I uh, was in Sifu, the more that I realized that it was actually beneficial to our members. It kept them aware of trends in the industry. It made sure that you know if somebody was being treated poorly by uh, an, uh, an editor or an agent, so-called editors or so-called agents specifically, um, that we, we raised a ruckus and we let people know to avoid those people. Right. We've had uh, people from Writer Beware right. um, exactly. on, on the show before. And they do a fantastic right. job. But time after time, I ended up seeing that this was not just, not just a club of cool people to, to be in, but uh, uh, an organization that actually had the interests of people like me uh, at, it, at, at, at its heart. And eventually, it came to a point where I thought it was important for me to become much more active. The first thing I did was I was on a committee about copyright. Uh, and then after that, uh, a couple years later, I ran for, for president. And I've been president now. I'm on my third term. It will be my last term as president uh -huh. because I think three is enough for me. I think it's also enough for SIFWA. They should have some new blood in there for next year. Uh, but it, it's been a really interesting position. I mean, I've, I feel very fortunate that uh, I have a great board. The other people who, who are uh, uh, running the place, uh, they're all very smart. They're all very dedicated. They're very competent. Uh, we all get along very well. We make sure that we always keep the interest of the organization at heart. And uh, at the end of the day, I think uh, we are doing good for, for our members. We're also, you know, and it's also been fun for me. I'm high profile enough that I can do some things that I think other people have not been able to do. Uh, an example is I uh, am part of this thing right now called the Humble Ebook Bundle. Which uh, we I are. bought it. Yes, <laughs> it's uh, a, a bunch of science fiction fantasy books. People pay what they want for it. Uh, in addition to paying the authors, which is always nice, we also assign some of the money goes to uh, CIFWA and its emergency medical fund. Uh, we've raised half a million dollars so far for the overall hum humble bundle, which means if our you know if all the defaults were used in terms of what to give, uh, you know we've made tens of thousands of dollars for CIFWA and its emergency medical fund already, which that's is great. Yeah. That's great. And John, we are out of time oh, for, no. for the Fast Forward interview. Thank you very much for taking time to join us. Thank you. And so for everyone here at Fast Forward, this is Mike Zipser saying take care.